Our theme for the month of May is creativity. And it, of course, mirrors what nature is doing outside. Creativity in all of its forms. We're celebrating art, speech, deepening of understanding, kindness toward others, and in a call to live courageously. Brene Brown speaks of creativity, although she doesn't quite use that word. She says, you either walk inside your story and own it, or you stand outside your story and hustle for your worthiness. Integrity is choosing courage over comfort and choosing what is right over what is fun, fast, or easy. It is choosing to practice our values rather than simply professing them. End of quote. This morning, I am so pleased to introduce four people who are walking inside their own stories and living lives of integrity. And in doing so, wait, can I just pause? Not that I want to put these people completely on a pedestal. We all do what we can when we can. And in doing so, we all make a contribution for, to a better world. So Catherine Watson, Joey Morrison, Katie Firethunder, and Benjamin Finnegan are going to speak with us this morning. Each of us is going to share their story about how they move from frustration or fear or worry or some combination to activism. Catherine is from our own congregation, and I'm going to have her come up first. Catherine gave testimony before the Montana State Legislature when the majority of legislatures were working toward restrictions on books that discussed LGBTQ content. So Catherine, if you are ready, come up and share your story. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Catherine, and my school gave uh, a few kids, or they gave everyone an opportunity that I took to go up to Helena and speak to the legislative about book banning. Uh, I went up there with my friend and we uh, did this uh, speech together uh, that I am going to say. Um, we disagree because ever, er, sorry. Yeah, so I did this with my friend Liv and we disagreed with this bill. Um, we disagree because everyone has the freedom of speech. Why can't everyone have the freedom of reading? We understand there's already a bill that states no teacher can teach or share a book with obscene content. We believe that LGBTQ content should not be considered obscene because it is a big topic today. Because LGBTQ is such a big topic, if children aren't exposed to this, they may not feel safe being themselves and may not understand this topic fully, which may be challenging for them in the future. In all, we disagree with this bill because it may affect uh, many people's future. And that was what we said to the state, le state legislative. And thank you. Thank you for doing that. And it's my understanding your brother testified as well. Yeah, I'm seeing some heads nod. He will share another time. It will be great. So I now want to ask um, Katie Fire Thunder to come up and share her story. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. My name is Katie Fire Thunder. Um, I started getting into organizing through activism um, when I was in high school. Well, I was born and raised here in Bozeman. And I went to high school here in Bozeman at Bozeman High. And before you graduate high school here, you have to do the senior project, which is a semester-long project where you research something and present it to the class. 
Um, and I decided to do mine on missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Um, this was an issue that I had known about but wasn't super like well versed in um, and wanted to learn more about kind of what was happening. Um, and I learned very quickly that a lot of what was happening with this epidemic was happening right here in Montana um, and very closely to us here in Bozeman. Um, during that time, it was also a legislative session, and they were hearing a bill called the Hannah's Act. Um, and so I went to that hearing to go in here and learn more about what this bill would do and like what solutions could we bring um, from a policy standpoint. Um, I just went and listened, so I'm very in awe of you, Catherine, for going and speaking, because even when I was about to graduate high school, I didn't even, couldn't even do that. So very brave. Um, but I went and listened, and I heard the stories of these mothers who were just heartbroken and were begging these lawmakers for justice. Um, and that experience, like, really, it was pretty changing for what I wanted to do and, like, what, what I felt like I needed to do at this point. Um, and I knew that this project wasn't just a school project, that this was much more at this point. Um, and so I, from that hearing, I met the mother of Henny Scott um, and began in contact, began talking to her about her experience um, with her daughter going missing and then later found um, murdered and, not, and her not being able to receive any sort of justice for that. Um, and so that story was one that I've, I really connected with. Um, and I began sharing, I wasn't a very loud kid in high school, I was very quiet. Um, but I began doing what I knew how to do, which was write and use the power of storytelling to share her story. And so I shared, I written down Henny Scott's story and May 5th is um, national, uh, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's Day. Um, and so on May 5th, I ended up sharing her story on Facebook. And it ended up getting a lot more attention than I had anticipated. Um, and from there, we ended up, I had other mothers of families reaching out to me, asking for me to share their stories, um, which was really hard. I was 18 years old. I still didn't know what I wanted to do after I graduated. And mothers were reaching out to me, a young 18-year-old girl, because they were the, I was the way that they had found in hope. Um, and being able to receive justice for their loved one. Um, and so it was very, a very heavy weight put on my shoulders. Um, and I ended up like reaching out to policymakers in different ways that I could find ways to share these stories. Um, and I ended up having the opportunity to meet and work with Kamala Harris when she was running for president and begin sharing more of these stories, specific, specifically stories of young women from Montana um, and how we could sh shape these stories to remember these as we're going through national campaigns, um, but also create policy out of them and make sure that, they, that this, w there's ways that we can end these things. Um, so I spent six months before attending college at Montana State um, working in Las Vegas and that was my first time I had know or had figured out or learned what organizing was. Um, I had no idea what it was at all. Um, and so through that experience, I saw how people in Las Vegas, specifically the Latinx community, was able to meet and like provide community um, and talk to each other about the issues that they had cared about and that they were being impacted by. Um, and how that once they all come together, how we could work to fight and bring solutions to those issues. Um, and that was really important and very, like, I learned a lot in that experience and knew after that campaign had ended that I wanted to take what I had learned and bring it back to Montana. Um, and so came back to Montana um, and I began working um, for our, like the Democratic Party and began just doing electoral work. Um, and I kept seeing time and time again how that wasn't really working and bringing the solutions and, I, and sense of community that I really had seen when I was in Las Vegas. Um, and so I remember being like, I want to take a little bit of, of a break for electoral politics, but I still wanted to find some way to be involved in social justice work. Um, and so there was this group called Bozeman United for Racial Justice, and they were doing a little afternoon picnic. And so I decided to go to that picnic and go in here and see what they were all about. Um, and 
yeah, at that picnic, they announced they were doing an electoral campaign. And so I was, I was like, well, <laughs> um, I guess I have a little bit of electoral experience. Let me help just this once, because I, I see a lot more of community in this group and want to be able to bring, um, yeah, want to, I feel invested in this and I want to see how I can help. Um, and that experience working on that campaign, volunteering, doing all of it was how I feel like we bring change in this community. Um, it was a young, scrappy campaign, but it was, it was so fulfilling. And I remember um, after we had lost, I have lost a lot of electoral campaigns in my day. And um, I remember feeling really, um, after every loss, feeling very heartbroken and just feeling like it would drain me every loss because you put so much into this and then all of a sudden it's done. And then the people that you work with leave and they go and do their own things, go work on another campaign. But I remember that night on our campaign that I looked around and I knew the people that I was surrounded by, they weren't going anywhere. And that we were just beginning and we were just going to start off on our campaign. Um, and from that point forward, I've been involved in organizing, uh, and I'm involved in it because I believe in our community, and I believe that we are all stronger together, and that once we all come together and have a same purpose for change, that we can create that change. So, thank you. Now we will hear from Benjamin Finnegan. Good morning, everybody. My name is Benjamin Patrick Finnegan. Um, I'm 26 years old. I grew up here in Bozeman. Um, and for the last five years, I've worked for an organization that is trying to fight for federal legislation that can address the climate crisis. Um, and I'm one of six elected leaders on, um, of, of Bozen Tenants United, along with Katie and, and Joey. Um, yeah, I, I, was, uh, I was born um, with a different name. I was born named um, Zhang Chan because I was born in, in Korea. Um, and yeah, when I think about um, the, the story of what got me to where I am today, <coughs> I think about um, uh, my adoption, which, which to me was um, the, the sort of first thing that happened to me when, when I merged into the world. And it was um, an experience that was both, I think, an experience of love and also of violence. Um, and the violent part being the separation um, from, from my birth mother and from um, the land that my ancestors had, had existed with and cultivated um, many, many generations back. Um, and, and the violence of that experience sort of followed me into, into the United States where I grew up um, here in Bozeman. And I carried a lot of anger and bitterness um, in my body, sometimes in ways that I didn't understand. Um, and I noticed a lot of things around me um, that didn't seem right, um, ways that I experienced race growing up here in Bozeman in the early 2000s. Um, when, I, when I saw that um, folks that I loved were sent to prison because they didn't have enough money and, and stole. Um, when I saw violence acted out in all these very, very small ways um, between people of, of different genders, um, bullying in, in, in school. And for me, it was never a question of, of if I was going to take action. Um, I always knew that I was going to do something to try to change the way things were. Um, but it wasn't really until I, I stepped into the world of organizing and the world of movements and the legacy of those things that I began to approach making change from a different place. Before it had come from this anger um, and this desire to see the things that hurt people burn down. I wanted to end those things. Um, 
And the first organizers that I met who sort of carried this flame from the past, from the civil rights movement, from the labor movement, um, they offered me this gift of the past and stories of the folks who came before us, um, folks that are probably sitting um, with, with us in this room today, um, stories of folks who fought and won so many of the things that make our lives better that, that we have today, that we take for granted, the, the five-day work week and, and eight-hour work day, um, the, <laughs> the, uh, the environmental protections that we have, that we still have, um, the ability for so many more folks to vote and participate in our democracy, and, I, and, I could, and we could go on and on. And they gave me stories of, of the fighting that those folks did and the struggle that they waged um, so that we could get to, to where we are to continue the fight. Um, they gave me that, that gift of the past so that it could sort of expand what I could see as, as possibility going forward. And they also gave me the gift of, um, of agitation and, and being, being this thorn in my side and asking me questions like, if you, were, if you were the president, what would you do right now if you had all that power? Or in 20 years, what kind of world do you want to be growing up in? What kind of world do you want to be raising kids in? Because you're, you're going to be around. Um, in 50 years, in 70 years, when, you're, when, when, the sunset, when the sun of your life is setting, what kind of world do you want to be leaving behind? What sort of legacy do you want to be leaving after your time here on this earth? And those questions really hit me in my gut, and they, they stayed with me, and they're always in the back of my head in, in, in some way. And it was, that, it was that agitation and that pushing and the gift of the, of, the, of the past and of imagining the future that shifted my relationship with change making and made it about the work of, of building towards something and towards, towards the future that we can have, um, depending on the choices that we make here today. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a thing that a mentor of mine, um, who is an incredible, incredible organizer, um, once told me that just always stays with me, and it's, it's written up on this little whiteboard in my room. And, and it's really simple, and it's just that movement building, um, which is the work that that I do and the work that organizers do. We build movements, um, masses of regular people who, with our energy and time united, can, can create movement in the world um, and move people who are in inertia and stillness into action towards change. And the quote is just that movement building is about believing in the impossible. Um, and when I think about my movement ancestors and the folks who came before me who were also living through apocalypse and living through violence um, and the, the conditions that they, that they lived in when so many things that we take for granted now seemed impossible. Um, it, it fortifies me and it reminds me that um, that, that that is the work and and I, I don't know, I, this, was, this is very unprepared, but I, I, I guess I just want to say that I feel very grateful to be in this room with you all. Um, and I feel grateful to be here with you all and, and to, to, share, to share this room with you all. I want to invite you all into the work of movement building, of believing in the impossible with me. Um, that's what we're doing here in Montana. That's what we're doing at Bozeman Tennis United. I think about the work that we can do that can be planting seeds now to, to radically change how this state is 10 years down the line, 15 years down the line. And I want to invite you all into that work with me and to talk to Joey and Katie and I afterwards. Thank you. Last but not least, Joey Morrison.
Hi, everybody. I'm going to have to do my best to uh, stay still in front of the microphone. I'm a mover when I'm talking. Um, yeah, my name is Joey Morrison. Um, I use he and him pronouns. I originally grew up in eastern Montana in the bustling metropolis of Mile City. Um, <laughs> thank you. The one voice that I get back, that's what I look for. Um, and growing up there, I, I, from a very early age, confronted the, some of the harsher truths of the world that we're in, that it doesn't, doesn't always work the way that we're taught it is in school, that those that do something wrong are treated fairly and are taken care of, and they grow, and they learn, and they rehabilitate, and then they come out. And speaking specifically about the, the criminal justice system, I... My father was uh, sentenced to 30 years in prison when I was about nine years old. And it was really quickly in, in phone calls with him because he was, still, he was still my dad. I still loved him. Um, and he was really the closest parent that I had, even though I lived with my mom. My dad was still very present for me. But hearing over in, in two-minute timed phone calls the ways in which he was being, being abused and exploited by our by our prison system forced me to really reckon with some of the ways that we, that I was taught um, how we deal with people who cause harm, how we deal with people who do something wrong. And it made me start to realize that actually there's a lot of ways that that intersects with the people that I'm surrounded by. My siblings both struggled with, with drug and alcohol addictions. I'm the first male in my family to actually not have struggled with alcoholism by this age. And that is deeply entrenched in the ways in which our society values or devalues people. So I knew from a very early age that I, I didn't like the world that I was growing up in, that there was something about it that seemed really wrong to me. And I had a, a, a really deep anger towards this world that hurts people, that, that devalues people, that exploits people. And I sort of forgot about a lot of it by the time I got to school, so I came out to go to school at MSU and, and sort of found myself uh, as like a hyper competitive, really super student kind of person. Uh, I was really keen to self-sacrifice and destroy myself. Uh, I was working nights at our, at our shelter. I was working at the warming center. And then by day, I was taking upwards of you know, 20 plus credits every semester. So I was, I was effectively sleeping at times 10 to 15 hours a week um, to be able to be a successful student and I was constantly getting praised for doing that. I was winning scholarships, I was getting awards, I was getting promotions. I was seen as someone who's making change, someone who's doing the right thing. And I got to do lots of really shiny, impressive things. I got to conduct research in, in three different disciplines on three different continents, and all these things that certainly set me up for my place on the academic conveyor belt to participate in the credentials arms race to be really, really that super smart, super person. But I, it took some time of, of looking back at what I was doing and actually a mentor who sat me down and, and was effectively like, look, I've seen people do what you're doing and they destroy themselves and they get really sick or they develop illnesses or they just, they, they start to hate all the things that they're doing. And I started to see myself in that. I started to see that actually that motivation that I had from a really young age to make change wasn't happening. It took a really self-agitational moment of research in these areas was not actually helping the people that I was researching. It took realizing that a homeless shelter is never going to end homelessness. And that was hard for me to realize because I had come to really love the social work I was doing and it still needs to keep happening and I've kept doing it but with the realization that that isn't gonna change the world. That isn't going to end these problems. And what, what it took me was having to reckon with my response and feelings towards myself and towards power. And seeing power as this, this fundamentally corrupting bad thing that we should never wanna touch only actually further enables the people who have power right now to keep it and keep doing what they wanna do with it. And it was in those reflections that I started to see myself in the work more. I was initially coming to organizing from a place of, I want to help people. I want to be a service. I want to just 
be, I want to destroy myself like I was before for the sake of other people. But then when I started to see myself in the work, I started to realize that actually a lot of my desire to change the world comes from a really deep-seated fear. That I'm very afraid of the direction that our world is going in. And I cannot afford any longer to sit silently and let that happen. And it has started to let me see that actually so much power comes from building deep relationships with the people in community, with coming together and s with so many people who, I feel like I've had a half dozen conversations with people in this room before that are right on the cusp of like realizing, man, something doesn't feel right and I don't know what to do about it. Something doesn't feel right and I don't know how to, I don't know how to stop it. And it was starting to see that, that that when one person has that fire, like that mentor, those mentors for Benjamin, like mentors for me, and then it lit me on fire. And I was so animated at seeing a world that could be different. And it started to make me a little less afraid. It started to make me feel a little bit more hopeful and actually see that, that fundamentally, hope is, is a deeply radical act. Hope in, in and of itself can so often be resistance to those that have power that don't wanna, don't wanna give it to us, that don't wanna give it to people like me, that don't wanna give it to people that are suffering and struggling. And it really grounded in me that organizing is, is the solution to building that power, to, to answer those calls that I'd had so many times as a social worker or as an academic, that this is the, this is the way I make the change that I wish that I'd always been able to do before. And in that is still a lot of, uh, a lot, most of the time I'm still deeply afraid. I am afraid of, I'm afraid for my, for my father. I'm afraid for my siblings. I'm afraid for myself, whether I get sick or I get hurt and I can't work anymore and seeing the way that our world helps those people or ignores them. And I really just, uh, I said yes to come here and talk with, with y'all and speak in front of you because because of these conversations I've had with so many of you that are just right there waiting for that moment, that moment to move you out of your, your resting inertia to come and, and to fight with us and to, to try to build this world together. Um, because when we come together and we, and we work and we get, get deeply organized and build deep relationships, that, that future, that world that we're building towards becomes inevitable. Thank you. There's so much more we could say, but I think it will be lovely to sit with all these stories during the musical meditation. And I want to thank all of you who make it possible for Bozeman Tenants United to be meeting in our building. That is a huge gift, and, um, and I know we're, you are welcome to come anytime. It's on the UUFB calendar you will be inspired.